What is your name? My name is Shirley Morrison Coachman Moravec. No, I just go by Shirley Moravec. I was born here in Clearwater, as was my dad. Um, his family were pioneers here in Clearwater. So I was born here. Actually, it was his father who came to Clearwater around 1889, 1898. What was his name? Um, my grandfather was S.S. Coachman, and then he had a brother, E.H. Coachman, and they worked on projects together. But it was my grandfather who bought probably 600 acres from the McMullen family uh, when he arrived. That included orange groves, raw woodland, um, and my grandfather grew oranges. And then my family, of course, helped him. And for 50 years, we grew oranges and grapefruit and shipped them. Well, one of them is housing. Um, you see very few orange groves anymore. You see very few um, plots of wood, woodland, uh, wetland, uh, swamps. You don't see very much of that anymore. And I remember as a, as a child wandering around on six or seven hundred acres through groves, through woods, picking huckleberries. Um, you just don't see that anymore. Of course, you don't see the rattlesnakes and the wildcats either, but I remember being very careful about where we went. Uh, whether we were alone or together, you just expect to see a snake, a big rattlesnake, a big diamondback rattlesnake. We had lots of those in the north part of our grove, the northeast part. Yeah. Well, I feel a little bit crowded in. I live in town now. And I, I think I always knew I would. Um, but there's, there's no place to go back to. Um, there is no place to show my children where I grew up, how I grew up. Um, my two oldest children remember when we had an orange grove and grapefruits and we'd have um, times where we would ride through in the, in the car on the way to work or on the way to school. And it was always fun. They, they took a lot of pride in, in that. My, my brother, my son, his cousin, they would have grapefruit fights in the grapefruit trees. And that's not with the big squishy ones. That's with the little green ones. They hurt real bad. <laughs> but um, it's not there anymore. I played baseball or softball with my brothers and my sister in our yard. That's what we did for fun. Didn't have a bike because there was no place to ride it, no sidewalks. And a county road went right in front of our house. People went 45, 50 miles an hour, so you just didn't have a bike. My, my older brother had a bike and we shared it with him, but there was no place to go um, with a bike. I don't remember about people playing sports unless it was a sport in school. Football, baseball, tennis, and that was about it. Maybe volleyball. Pretty much we were, we were protected from that. My parents didn't talk about it. Uh, we knew there was a war. We knew that lots of changes were made in the household. Um, I still have some of the little red coupons that you got. But as a, a young child, all we were interested in was playing and napping and getting something to eat. I, I, I can't remember anything else from that. However, Many years later, I, I married a man who was in World War II. It's a Navy man. He's my husband right now. We've been married 27 years. I remember we had a, a floor model radio that was maybe four feet tall, rounded at the top, and we would sit there and listen to 
serials like The Fat Man and on Saturday afternoons they would have lots of programs like Johnny Diamond and I can't remember the rest of them. Um, the, the Thin Man and those were fun to listen to. Several times at night there were some programs that were entertaining. My dad would listen to news and we would just ignore it. We were probably setting the table or something for dinner. <laughs> but it was a long time before we got a television and that was when we bought somebody's in the family who had to leave and do something. So we bought their television set, brought it home, and I'm thinking it was about the time I began high school. Um, it, it was different. We, you didn't have 24-hour programs. You just had programs from dawn to about 9 o'clock, 10 o'clock. <laughs> we had a lot of homework, so I didn't get a lot of radio or television. We had a lot of homework. That's a big question. I'm not sure how, how to answer that. To preserve history, it's going to have to be many, many people doing many, many different things. It's not just one thing that you can do. To preserve a history, you would have to have someone do it in a school system, which they have, and they've saved buildings like South Ward Elementary. Um, I went to North Ward Elementary. That, and the building is still there, and, and that's a fine piece of history, too, and a fine piece of my life. I, I enjoyed that school. Tell me a little bit about it. It was a small school, North Ward Elementary on North Fort Harrison. It was not a big school, but we had a principal's office that you, you dare not go in unless you were sent with attendance or something like that. But we had a, a wonderful kindergarten. I remember sitting on the floor a lot there. Um, that's where you learned to read, to perform, to write, to sing. It, it was a lot of fun. Sits on a wonderful piece of property. Oh yes, the oaks are beautiful. Right there on the water. Oh yes. Sarah Byers was <laughs> was in charge of the library and she knew each kid by name. I remember when you checked out a book, she would look at it to see if it's a book that you should have or did she have to call your mother. She had a pencil with a little date stamp clamped on it and she would stamp the date and then write down who had the book and it was kept in, in a pencil. <laughs> it was amazing, but she encouraged us to read and we loved the old library because you could go down to the cellar, to the basement, and, and very, very little of that building was really good library space, even though it was a Carnegie Library that was built um, after the war, or was it before the war? Before. I'm thinking 1916 or something like that. But I enjoyed that. We enjoyed looking at books, and my, my sister loved to read as much as I did, and we would go and get three or four books, Nancy Drew books or Hardy Boy books or just any books. We loved to read. And today I see that in my grandchildren. I, I like that, the fact that they love to read and they're good at it. Oh, I think it's a beautiful library. I love that library. I love walking in there. I take my grandchild in there maybe once or twice a month, and she can just go to the second floor. I can sit down. She can read anything she wants. She can read it to me, to herself. She can pick out books to check out. She goes to the window, uh, which is the west, the west wall <laughs> is all window that looks out over Coachman Park. It's just a beautiful sight. You see the bay, the bridge, the boats, um, the beautiful stream in Coachman Park with the sculptures that I think David Epling did. Really neat. When I was a girl, like in junior high and high school, it was fun. You didn't think about putting on 
um, stuff to keep you from getting sunburned. You wanted to get sunburned. And it was fun. You wore a bathing suit. You went down to the water. You got wet. And you came back and you waited to watch boys walk by. And eventually somebody would stop and we'd sit and talk because we went to class together. There was um, a radio station right there at the Pier 60 area. It was called uh, the, the Pier. And, and the radio station broadcast right there. Um, and that was kind of fun to know that, that that was a... But you know something? I would never have thought that you could get a dollar for a bottle of water. And, of course, on the beach, that's the only thing you really wanted was a big, tall glass of water, but nobody would give it to you. You'd have to buy a Coke or something. And that was okay. But I can't imagine giving real money for a bottle of water. We had deep wells on our property at home and hoses. Not a problem. <laughs> loved the beach. Loved going to people's houses who lived there. Um, birthday parties. It was always a lot of fun. And then when I was in high school, there was um, the south end of the beach. And I, I imagine you have heard about that. It was a place where you could go and park. But it was also a place where my youth group from church would go and have a picnic at night because you could build a fire right there on the beach. And you could roast a hot dog, marshmallows, whatever. And that was always fun. Now you can't build a fire there. And I understand why, and it's okay. But it was fun then when the, when the south end of the beach was nothing but a bunch of dredged up sand. Enjoyed that very much. As a student, I, I just remember I had some good teachers, some teachers who were lots of fun. Um, I, I remember events that I was involved with, like running for office, or I was cherry pie baking champion for four years. I thought that was pretty cool. Um, and I remember my classmates um, getting together with them at lunch or I have a lot of photographs that show our fun after graduation party that the Rotary Club had for us. I have a lot of photographs that show our senior sophistication day, which means that means that we dressed up that day. Um, we wore beautiful dresses with crinolines and high heels, and the boys wore jackets and ties. That was really fun, too. And it's really neat because just recently we had our 50th class reunion uh, from Clearwater High. That was just a couple of weeks ago. And that was fun. We had 150 people attend um, that event. That was probably 30. And, and that's a good number. Um, I know of, of 18 women that I have lunch with every month. And we all graduate in the class. Um, and then being on the committee to organize a reunion, um, I'm aware of lots of people who have been to the 25th reunion, the, the 30th, the 40th, and then the 50th, people who came year after year after year. That was kind of neat. But home, hometown, we had a committee of like 15 who lived nearby. And there's probably another 15 who live in Clearwater. I don't think I was ever aware of the school being overcrowded. I know that when I graduated from high school, there were about 20,000 people. I taught in Pinellas County for about 30 years before I retired in 1993. Uh, taught English, creative writing, journalism. Um, I was the advisor of the newspaper at Clearwater High for 21 years. And then I had another 10 years in the county. Um, Dixie Hollins, Northeast, and then spent two years at Largo High and the rest of my career at Clearwater High. 
I can get excited about that. I love teaching school. I was, I was pretty good at it, and I got many honors, but my students got many, many honors. I was telling a lady last night that in the last 15 years at Clearwater High, my students won over 900 writing awards, design, photography, um, just overall page design. Mostly, though, they were writing awards for editorials or sports stories or feature stories. Um, and I was very, very proud of those kids. They just did wonderful things. Um, the Clear Light, which was the newspaper at Clearwater High, is the newspaper I worked on as a student in Clearwater. Um, in fact, Lois Arnold was my Clear Light advisor. Uh, as well as my English teacher. So she was one of the, the points that I, I aimed for. I wanted to be a teacher just like Lois. Um, and then I had uh, a class of English with Margaret Howe. I was one of her students. That was really neat. Um, because I worked for her later on, when she was the supervisor of language arts in Pinellas County. The first mall was at the Sunshine Mall in, in Clearwater. And of course it's gone now, but it was very uptown and a lot of fun to visit. A lot of fun to go and buy clothes for the kids. Um, I really liked that mall, but we still patronized Meyer's department store until it closed, and Frank's department store until it closed, and Short's men's store before it moved to another location. In fact, um, my sister and I worked in Short's men's store during Christmas break when we would come home from college. Where'd y'all go to college? We both went to Florida State, 1968. I remember the strike. I remember the fact that there was no ne negotiating for salaries for teachers. I was a young teacher at that time. I only had a couple of years of experience, but teachers who were teaching with me um, would, would talk about issues. Um, and the biggest issue for all of us at that time was you couldn't go to the school board and say, look, we need some more salary. The school board would say, we're going we're gonna to let you all have so much money for next year. And, and you're going to have to take it and be quiet. So that was one thing. There were other issues, too, on the walkout. And it came to a point where many, many teachers got up and walked out. I did with them. My dad had a talk with me about that. He said, how are you going to feed those children? Because I was a single mother at that time. It was scary. I lasted two weeks out of class before my children got hungry. And, and I had to find something to do. So I thought, nope, I want to be a teacher. So I went to see Bill Justice, who was the new principal at Northeast High School at that time. And he said, I know you're a good teacher, and this is a good school, and we're going to do fine here. He's a fascinating man. He is. And I worked for him later on at Clearwater High when he was principal there. One of the finest principals I ever worked for, an entirely fair-minded person who listened to other people. My grandfather, S.S. Coachman, uh, was the first chairman of the county commission. He was involved with the group of bad guys who threw up a, a courthouse in Clearwater overnight when it was, uh, I guess he wanted to make it the county seat. So he and his cronies worked night and day to put up a building. Then he went to Tallahassee 
to get the government to sanction that Clearwater was the county seat of Pinellas County. So he and my grandfather, uh, E.H. and my grandfather worked on projects like the Bellevue Biltmore Hotel. They set up a sawmill right there on the property and sawed all the lumber for the Bellevue Biltmore Hotel back in, I'm not sure when, what year that was. Um, also, my uncle Horace, E.H. Coachman, was um, on the board of directors at the Bank of Clearwater and the First National Bank. Um, and that was a long time ago, but that was when they finally made a deal with Clearwater to sell Clearwater Coachman Park um, for a very, very reasonable price, uh, a lot less than the offer that they had had from um, in industrial people who wanted to build big, ugly buildings. I think he would think that it's beautiful. Um, and I think he would have been for some renovations also. But it was like the backyard view of my, of my uncle's house. He had a house where the library is uh, standing right now. In fact, when I go to the library and I look out the back window, I see a cedar tree there that uh, in all likelihood he had planted. So, and I know it's over 100 years old. It's just a beautiful old gnarled cedar tree. But I think he would think it's beautiful. I think that he would be happy that it's used for a lot of, of concerts and events. I think that's, that's really neat. Um, he wanted, my uncle wanted Coachman Park to be used for the public. That Coachman Park would be more green. All right, the flat part of Coachman Park was dredged up. Um, Bill Wallace, um, another old timer, um, I went to high school with him. But he, he can tell you the exact date that that was done. What was donated was where the library is and that patio to the west. Um, yes, the parking lot was also supposed to be for the public good. And there are still trees there on the bluff uh, that I remember as a girl. Um, I, I realize that there's a need for parking and as long as there's enough green for people to play, have fun, that's fine. About the fishing, I don't think my grandfather and my uncle would have had time to fish. I don't think they were fishermen at all. I think uh, they would send uh, an employee to the boat docks to buy uh, a mullet or two for dinner. That was about it. But in those days, I don't think people had a whole lot of time for pleasure. You don't see croquet games um, on Coachman Park grounds. Um, I don't think he would have done anything like that. He was too busy with politics and business and a huge family and um, an area in Clearwater that demanded his attention. His favorite project was working on Coachman Lakes Estates. It was a subdivision that took probably two or three years to get it off the ground. Uh, today there are lots that are minimum of an acre and a quarter up to two and three quarters acres and lovely homes. The main thing about that subdivision is that trees were kept, palmettos were kept, and if you wanted to um, love your palmettos because they were hundreds of years old. Um, you could keep them, trim them. Some people just took them out. But my dad loved the fact that it had lake, trees. Um, and it was the site of some of the rotary turkey shoots a long time ago. 
And I remember there was a fire there a long time ago that was very scary because it was so large. The flames were so large. He also worked on another subdivision, uh, Coachman Hill Estates, which surrounded his property. Um, and those two were large lots. Um, and it didn't take any time at all for that, that, that project to get off the ground. Lots of people wanted the large wooded lots, which is kind of neat. My dad enjoyed doing that. It was creative. He worked with my mother on that. Um, also, he supervised and ran the, the groves um, and the coachman building down, downtown. Um, he had an office there. He would hear problems of tenants, um, share a cup of coffee with some, um, but he kept the building viable and and he, he loved going there every day. He went sometimes twice a day to spend an hour or two in the office. My, my grandchild, mm -hmm. I do, but I don't want to overload her and make her think, oh no, another story by grandmother. <laughs> but I take her places and I say, no, nah, we have a little history here. Look at this monument. This, it tells you who, who made Coachman Park famous, who made it possible, and, and that's your family. And she's not real impressed, not yet. She's eight. Um, I pick her up every day after school um, and supervise her homework. And if I think she needs more, I give her more, and she does it. She loves to do homework. But she's a good reader. Sometimes I tell her stories about growing up, about jumping across ditches that had crawdads in them, and cotton mouth moccasins and she can't relate not yet yes I love that church it was beautiful my grandfather SS coachman was on the board there he was uh, I don't know what he was but he was one of the leaders when they melt when they met in just a small building. When they decided to build that church, they sent the elders or whatever to Georgia to look for plans for a church that they liked. So they toured several towns looking at Baptist churches. They found one that they liked. The, the people in that church gave them the plans. They brought them back home and built the Calvary Baptist Church. That beautiful sanctuary, that beautiful dome, beautiful woodworking inside. It's. Have you been down there it's since they tore it I've, down? I've been down there. It's sad. A lot of things have been torn down from, from my own history. Uh, if I wanted to go back to my home, the house is not there. If I wanted to go back to my grandmother's home, her house is not there. Um, we grew up playing on the steps of the log cabin. That's not there anymore. So to go home, it's not there. I'm a member of the Episcopal Church of the Ascension. It's a church, very old church in Harbor Oaks where my grandmother was confirmed. My mother was married there. I was married there, so were my daughters. Um, a lot of, a lot of history there. It was always we always had a good crowd there. It was never full, but it was a pretty good crowd. And in the winter time, we had more people attending the, the services. I just remember the beautiful wood, the eagles' faces on the, on those struts up in, in the ceiling. I remember how beautiful the stained glass was. And it's the stained glass at Ascension is beautiful, gorgeous, just beautiful. I picked out my favorite window when I was about 12, I'm sure. Which window? Oh, it was on the right, um, near where we got sermons 
all the way up on the, on the right. When I was a kid, the point just west or just east of the Coachman Building was a dime store. It was um, Woolworths, McCrory's, they were side by side. And that was kind of neat when you were growing up to have dime stores to look in when you got to town. Town going to town was a was an adventure back then because we lived out where the groves were in the boonies. It was um, it was good and it was bad. Um, you didn't have neighbors and you didn't have children to play with, um, but. It was quiet. <laughs> it was very quiet, very serene. First of all, it was a it was a privilege to get to go to town. Um, we could go Saturday morning with my dad. Um, he would go in about eight thirty and leave right on the dot of twelve when a siren went off in the mid midtown. That was to let you know it was noon on Saturday. But it was it was uh, something to to really look forward to. And we didn't get to go every Saturday, but we would go with my dad. He'd park his car by the post office. He'd go to the post office and walk up to his building, and we'd walk with him. And we'd have a quarter to spend, so we'd go in the dime store um, and look for something, and it would take us an hour. One of the doctors who had an office in the Coachman building would give us $2 every month and that was to go buy comic books for his waiting room. But he said, take them home and read them first. So that was, that was a, neat, a neat thing to do. We enjoyed that. And um, downtown had people who walked back and forth, people who went to work, people who did shopping. We had some department stores downtown Clearwater that, that had parking right next to it that you'd go in and buy a dress or you'd buy shirt belts. We had menswear, we had a hardware store, we had banks, we had jewelry stores. Um, Tilly's jewelry store was really beautiful, gorgeous, built-in mahogany cases. Uh, it was just a beautiful store, had gorgeous antique fixtures. That was kind of neat to go into. And it had movie houses, the, the Capitol and the Ritz. Uh, sometimes we would stay and go to a movie. Sometimes we'd be driven back that afternoon for a movie. At the Ritz, it was always a double feature, um, and one of them was a serial, meaning that you just got to, to watch part of it, and then the next Saturday you'd have to come back to see the next part of it. That was really kind of neat. In fact, I found a, a ticket stub the other day from the Capitol Theater, and it was 36 cents to get in. And I, that's just unfathomable. I can't understand that today. But I loved going downtown. So did my brothers and my sisters. And um, you saw people, and you always spoke to them. And if you didn't know them, you just nod your head. One of the joys of going downtown was going into the post office. Very often on the steps of the post office was a man called Cy Lowry. And I think his name was Silas. Um, he has grandsons who live in, in the Clearwater area. He was the last horseback sheriff of Pinellas County. He rode a horse. He was the sheriff the whole sheriff of the whole county. He was very large. He, he enjoyed food, but he always had a Hershey bar in his pocket for children. Or if he didn't have a Hershey bar, he'd give you a nickel, and he'd, he'd say, go on down there to Brown Brothers and get yourself an ice cream cone. And, and he loved children. Um, and of course, children loved him because he had a pocket full of nickels, or he might have had a, a Hershey candy bar. That was his favorite. That was fun. Before my family sold property to this shopping center, 
uh, on the corner of US 19 and Sunset Point Road. Before they sold that, they thought, well, it's worth a try. And so they drilled an oil well where somebody told them there might be oil there. And after a couple of months, they realized there's not going to be any oil there. So they gave up, capped it off, and sold the property. So it's still there. It's probably been covered over like a lot of things have been covered over. Um, I know there's a drag line buried near St. Pete College um, on some landfill. What's a drag line? A drag line was a steam shovel. I don't know, did you ever read the, the mm -hmm. book, Mike Mulligan and his steam engine, oh, Mar I've seen steam Marianne? A drag line is just a big crane that digs stuff and moves trash around and it was mechanical. Um, and they're, of course, outdated, and if they died, uh, you just tip it over and cover it up. That's what happened. The biggest change is the development, the building of buildings, uh, large buildings, large subdivisions. Um, I, I noticed that we don't have any or very few gated communities like they do down in Fort Myers and Naples and Bonita Springs. It's one gated community after another with brand new everything. It's I really can cannot identify with that. I like my old house with its creaks and groans. Um, and I live in a neighborhood that's been there since 1923, which is really a nice neighborhood. I always brag about it because we have all ages, um, all races and children and old people and in between and many dogs that get walked to the park on a leash and it's a very comfortable neighborhood. In fact, my dad told me before he passed away, he said, there used to be a grove right here and when we walked to school, we would come right through here and steal an orange and I thought that was so funny because he came from a huge orange grove. <laughs> where he lived, and he thought it was neat to steal an orange. But I think he was talking about, I just nostalgia. I think he just liked that idea. <laughs> but he did walk to school, and it was four miles. 